Hi, I'm Big Ben with Equip Tips. Join us as we go into off-camera lighting and stepping into a strobus approach. Many of you are natural light shooters. Today we're going to be talking about going into artificial lighting, comparing and contrasting the difference between speed lights or flashes and studio strobes. Let's go. Put on your lab coats. Many of you own a DSLR, you've done natural light photography. Next thing you do, you have a lens or two, you go out and buy a flash, you slap your flash on your camera, you turn it on, you take a picture of someone, and next thing you know, it looks like they've been nuked by some type of biological warfare. We don't like this. Today, let's take the strobe off the camera. Let's find a way to trigger it. And we're in a three-part series, we're gonna tell you how to step into strobus photography. Let's compare the differences between, let's say, a studio strobe and a speed light or a flash. Flashes are usually much cheaper. They're an economical purchase. They're often, we often buy these well before we get into a studio strobe. Some of the pros of these is that they're lightweight. You can pack them in your camera bag. They offer automatic or TTL settings as we call them. And they also give us the most light for the buck versus, shall we say, a studio strobe, which is, gives us as much power as we want, has a larger line of modifiers or umbrella soft boxes, anything that changes the quantity or quality of light, as well as their durability and dependability. If we go into flashes, we need to find some way of getting our flash off the camera. We get our flash off the camera and we go to take a picture, the flash isn't going to fire. We got to find a way to trigger our flash. We can talk to it, we can write to it, we can wine and dine it, and it isn't going to fire unless we have a means of triggering this. Now there's three different methods that we use for triggering off-camera flash. The first method is proprietary or built-in settings. Nikon has a system called CLS, short for Creative Lighting System, that allows us to do this. You don't need anything more than a CLS enabled flash and a camera that's capable of using CLS. Most of Nikon's line of DSLRs do offer this option. Our second method of triggering off-camera flash is via a sync cord. A sync cord is simply a cable that plugs into a port on your camera. Most cameras have a sync port and if they don't, you can get a little adapter that fits on the hot shoe that allows you to put in a sync, port, sync cable which will then run to your flash and plug into the sync port of your flash. The problem is with this is now that you are in a wired setting, you are going to trip over cords and for every flash you use you're going to have to have a different sync cable. A more safer approach and the most used approach nowadays in triggering off-camera lights is to go with the radio system. A radio system pretty much uses that high-end cool stuff we call radio to send a wireless signal from a transmitter that goes on our camera over to a receiver that plugs into our flash. What's good about that? We no longer have the wires. No one's going to get tripped. We're not going to have any biological harm. Some of the great, great radio triggers out there come from Pocket Wizard, CyberSync, as well as uh, radio poppers. When we're talking about shooting wirelessly with the radio trigger, the thing that we want to keep in mind is that we don't have the automatic capabilities as we did when we had our flash on our camera. The key is, is that our camera needs to be in manual mode and our flash needs to be in manual mode. Unless we have the new Pocket Wizards TT1s and TT5 Flexes, all of the radio triggers right now that I'm aware of mostly only do one thing. They simply send the radio signal from a transmitter to a receiver that say on off. Therefore, if we want to make any adjustments to our power settings, we have to physically run over to our light and make those changes. Regardless of getting a workout and moving your lights and changing the settings, a wireless setup is usually the way to go. Some considerations when going to buy a flash, there's a few things you want to keep in mind. Flashes can become really expensive if you go for the brand new stuff. Most manufacturers that make these flashes, such as Canon and Nikon, have made awesome products throughout the years. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with going on eBay, your nearest used camera store or whatnot, to go and find an old used flash, such as this Nikon SB25. Uh, 
And since we are shooting in manual mode, meaning my camera's in manual mode and my flash is in manual mode, the only things when considering when buying a flash and taking a strobus approach is that one, you need to have a method for connecting your radio trigger, either a hot shoe adapter or a PC sync port. Uh, most of your flashes do have sync ports, some of them do not, be wary of that. And the other two options that you must have is a flash that has an adjustable power output as well as a manual mode. Let's talk a little bit about studio lights, mono lights, strobe lights, whatever you want to call them, such as these Elenchrom Ranger Quadras, which I love. I own a pair of these. And when I need more power than what my uh, flashes will offer to me, I usually go for these. They offer about 400 watt seconds in a package that's just a little bit smaller than a speed light. In, in my world, I'm obviously worshiping these things. <laughs> I dub the Excalibur of the lighting world. But not all of us can afford these things, and not all of us can have our Excalibur. You know, we can't pull our sword out of the stone at once, you know. We were eating off ramen noodles, you know, we just bought that new lens, we just got that camera. So the good option to start out with is a speed light, you know, such as some of these older ones. And as long as you can get a set of radio triggers and a way to trigger them, you can, you can use them. When we're talking about powering our speed lights, we're limited to battery power. And in most cases, that means a AA battery. The question is, is that there's so many types of AA batteries out there. There's alkaline, nickel zinc, zickel metal hydride, lion batteries. Which ones work best for a flash approach? Well, in flashes, what we use is the flash has a capacitor in there that slowly draws up power and stores it until the time where the flash needs to fire and discharge that power. So instead of having a constant power being drawn from those batteries, there's times where it'll put a hard drain on them, store that energy, the batteries are now at rest, we fire a flash, the capacitor now draws more energy in so we can fire it again. And the answer is simply this. They're called nickel metal hydride batteries. They are a cost-friendly, rechargeable battery that's sold at any camera retailer, any camera shop, as well as other retailers such as your conglomerate uh, takeover stores, box stores. The other thing to remember with nickel metal hydride batteries is that since they don't have a memory, they also lose their charge very quickly. So it's important that you charge these either the day before or the day of each shoot. You can't charge them once a month, come back six weeks later, put them in your flash and hopefully have a good output. Considerations when buying these is one, buy a quality set, avoid the ones that you can get cheaply, and make sure that they usually have an amperage of about 18 to 2,000 milliamps at the least. They do make some out there. Uh, most of them start out at about 1,800 milliamps, and if that's all you can get, that'll work. So now, if you're like me and you're a strobist, and you have a ton of flashes, there's a couple things that we need to be considered of. Since each of these run on batteries, I now have to have a set of batteries for every flash. And that means is that I have a lot of batteries. I swim in the batteries, I eat and breathe batteries. I'm always charging my batteries, whether it's in my car, in my house, in my bathroom I have a charger. It's very convenient. Make sure you have, a set of, have two sets of batteries for each flash. Have an A set and a B set. So while you're while your A set's charging, you can be using your B set and vice versa. So you always have a fresh set of batteries for each flash. I have a method that I do like to use as far as keeping my stuff organized. I simply went and got some address labels, went into my nearest word processing program and put a color on them. So now I have these colored labels on each set of my batteries so a big oaf like me can keep track of them and not lose which ones go to what. So this set's yellow and this set's blue. And I know that I now have an A set and a B set. And I even put the type on them, you know, so I know who's who. So this is for my SB25 flash, and it's the B set. And this set is for SB25, and it's, and it's for my other flash, or my two set. And so with that in mind, you can easily keep your batteries organized. You can keep them together. So as you acquire more flashes and buy batteries and sets, you're not mixing your old stuff with your new stuff. So now that we have establish how to power our flash. We have established how to trigger our flash via wireless triggers. And we now need to let our voice activated light stands go. Let's let our assistants do other things. 
They think they have a good union, although they're practically slaves. And let's go ahead and find a way to where we can mount our flash onto a light stand. And the best way to do that is an umbrella swivel adapter. They come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. And basically all it is, is kind of like an erector set or a little piece of that. It can screw right onto your light stand. It has a swivel, so you can pitch the pitch the angle of the light of which way it's going to be firing. And on top of that, we have a cold shoe mount, we call it. Hot shoe is when we have power going to it to trigger a flash. Cold shoe means it's cold, there's no power going through it. And we're simply going to slide it in, just like we would on top of our camera, and tighten it up. We now have our assistant free, our voice activated light stands are free to go do what they need to do, to go give, bring me a hot dog, you know, the usual stuff that I require on all my photo shoots. And we now have our flash mounted off camera in a safe and efficient way to where we can absolutely adjust it. The other good thing about this too, it has a hole right here in the middle where we can actually attach an umbrella and use it with an umbrella. So that's the way to attach that. One key thing to remember when you are attaching these is that the cold shoe mount being all metal and the contacts on the bottom of your flash are all metal. Well, metal and metal equals electrical shock and frying your flash. The best thing you want to do is either get some electrical tape or some gaffer tape. Put a little bit of gaffer tape over those over that metal of that thing so you can so you're not getting metal on metal and risk of frying your flash. I have done this. It wasn't a pretty sight, and unfortunately, it wasn't one of these older flashes. It was one of the new ones. So make sure that you tape over anything so the metal contacts aren't going to be hindering you. Thanks for coming with me and learning a little bit about flashes today. We're going to go into, we're, in future episodes, we're going to go more into flashes as well as learning some of the methods of TTL triggering as well as going into some modifiers and DIY projects. Tune in next week where we share, learn, and inspire each other. I'm Big Ben with Equip Tips, and I bid you happy shooting.